What you looking at, bitch? Why is my mother talking to me this way? Welcome to the world of a 10-year-old little black girl, lost and alone in a family filled with so much pain, sadness, and confusion. With the backdrop of sirens, police radios, and screams of pain, I stood at the end of the pitch black hallway of my grandma's house. No strength to move. I'm paralyzed with fear. I hear echoing cries and loud voices. So with the speed of a turtle, I walk down the hallway and I see my mother kneeling, her head down on my grandfather's lap, rocking back and forth and crying uncontrollably. He's praying while spraying WD-40 on his legs, a remedy he swore relieved arthritis. Paramedics were now in the house asking questions. Why is she crying? What happened? She was taken by ambulance to a mental hospital where she stayed for what seemed like an eternity. What happened to my mom? When's she coming back? Why did they take her? My mom's boyfriend, that bastard, had laced her joint with either PCP or meth, and she literally lost her mind. And I mean literally. The mom I knew was dead, a shell of herself, either crying all the time and her crushing and screaming and having imaginary conversations with herself. Her radiant smile with those blinding white teeth. Our weekend outings and yearly Olin Mills family portraits were now all distant memories. I had a great childhood. My mom worked full time. But being the only child sucked. Getting everything, now that was a plus. Spoiled was an understatement. How about a fur coat at the tender age of 10, diamond earrings, and a waterbed? Now that was all gone. My grandmother became my mother when my mom wasn't able. And she loved me like nobody's business. and was all I had. But in the Robson household, if you didn't praise the Lord and attend church regularly, you were going to hell. And I hated it. So it made me feel like I didn't belong. Being that I wasn't my mother's child, rebellion was in my blood. And I couldn't be forced to attend Sunday school, Bible study, and choir practice meetings. The streets were calling my name. Seven years later and 17 years old, still living with my grandma, I was ready for some fun. 10, 15, Friday night, okay, good, she sleep, yes. It's time to break free, I whispered to myself. I held my ear against my grandmother's door and hear that all too familiar sound. <sighs> she was snoring and she wouldn't hear a thing. I tiptoed to my room, pulled back the covers and created a lifelike sleeping me out of pillows. Turned on jamming Z90, my nightly routine, so as the slow jams played, I carefully slid open my window and was free into the darkness. My heart pounding so hard I could feel it in my throat. I am young, I am wild, I am free. Skipping school, smoking weed, just having a ball. <laughs> Tonight, I head to Mexico with my fake ID. Barely making it back in before the crack of dawn Sunday morning, trying to think of every sickness in the book to avoid church with a flu-blown headache and a sour stomach from drinking all them damn free drinks I got across the border, I just couldn't get up. God, please forgive me. Man, was that fun back then. Like carrying a switchblade for protection ultimately led to me getting kicked out of high school. And damn, I had done it now. My grandma was furious. Hurt and a little bit confused as to why I continued to make poor choices while she always had my back. So as we sat across the table from the school board and they made their permanent decision as if I cared, I just wanted the meeting to be over so I can go smoke. I walked fast and in front of my grandma so I didn't have to hear what she had to say. But at the same time, ashamed I had let her down. A new agenda. A trip to Southeast San Diego. A all new type of fun. But I was ill-equipped and not ready for a lot of what I was exposed to. Slick talking older men ready to take advantage of a young girl. Tell me what I wanted to hear, how beautiful I was, and that they'd love and take care of me. By now it was official. I was considered an outcast. A black sheep in the family. She's bad. She drinks and smokes. She hangs with gang members. So the slick talking and selling of a dream was music to my starved ears. The family alienation and isolation was creating a monster, slowly destroying my sense of self-worth and self-love. Because if your family gives up on you and treats you as such, you can't be any good, right? 
Well, those were my thoughts. So I continued down a long, lonely path full of regret, pain, and suffering. You better wake up and get that baby. Don't you hear him crying? I'm now 18 and the mother of a beautiful baby boy. My world has changed for the better. I was so in love with the father. Nobody could tell me different. But my grandma knew. I just wasn't ready to listen. Two children and a son and a daughter were the only thing beautiful about the relationship. And being that I wanted to feel love, I stayed and endured many lies, cheating, physical attacks from other women, and a horrible addiction that led to him stealing money from the kids and myself. Life sucked, but I fought hard to find a way out. April 18th at 1.30 p.m., my guardian angel, my strength, my protector, my grandma passed at 97 years old. The pain of losing her was unbearable. I couldn't breathe, talk, think, or grasp any of it. Not my granny, the one who loved me no matter what, my prayer warrior, the glue to my invisible piece of this dysfunctional family. I wanted to join her. A broken child living in an adult body, trying to find my way. I feel as things will never get better. The stress and depression is overwhelming. One day, by the grace of God and a lot of soul searching, I have a reality check. If I give up on my children, who will they have? No one. My family doesn't even love and help me. So they would end up in Polinsky, and they deserve so much more. I refuse to give up. Damn, it's foggy as hell. I can't even see my hand in front of my face. I'm on my way to see my son at the juvenile ranch facility in Campbell. Feeling flushed, hot. Sweat beads rolling down the side of my face. I reach over to the passenger side window and roll it down. Ugh, I hate this car, piece of crap. And if my stupid ass baby daddy would have answered his phone like he promised, I wouldn't be taking this trip alone, bastard. A knot has formed in my throat the size of the grapefruit. Panic and anxiety has set in and sends my mind racing at 100 miles. I'm going to have an accident or run into a tree or even worse off the road into a ditch where they won't find my lifeless body for weeks. Okay, shut up crazy. You're being irrational and dramatic as usual. Need to stop watching Dateline late at night. <laughs> I start to pray. Lord, if you help me make it to my destination safe and sound, I will remain positive and not become easily upset. Please guide my mouth with words of love, encouragement, positivity, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm angry at the fact that my son with his hard-headed ass has me driving way the hell up here for a visit when all he had to do was listen to my warnings and advice. You would think all the repeat visits to juvenile hall, school expulsions, drug use, and more would have scared him straight, but it did the opposite, and I was confused. He was well-liked and popular. All the kids loved him. ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder is what they called it. I tried everything they told me in a desperate attempt to help my baby boy. Counseling, both family and individual, reward systems, medication, nothing seemed to work. I saw a reflection of myself when I looked in his eyes. Depression, confusion, loneliness, giving it God and washing my hands seems to be the only option. But how can a mother do that? As I'm visiting my 16-year-old son in jail, I feel like I failed him. I'm relieved, though, when I look around and see the trees, buildings, and wildlife. This looks like sixth grade camp. I park the car and gather all his favorite snacks, food, and soda from the back seat and head up to visit my firstborn son. I find a safe spot to sit down on a filthy park bench tagged up with gang riding and wait. Cupping my face in my hands, I start to pray. I'm so tired. When I raise my head, I see my son. We are both smiling hard and wide, just smiling. I am beyond happy and all my worries are now at ease. He walks towards me and hugs me tight like he did when he was a kid and was gone all day at school. I start to cry. I'm okay, Mom. Don't worry. But the pain behind his eyes and disheveled look tell a different story. With great reluctance, he starts to tell me about the many fights he's had to initiate and racial tension. I look at him with horror in my eyes, and he pauses. I was getting down with them fools, was his exact words. Now the mother and me wanted to immediately grab the closest guard and get to the bottom of it, but I knew that wouldn't help. 
How's my little sis and bro doing, he asks. Fine, I say, just missing you and wondering when you're coming home. Tell him I love him and sorry for not being a good big bro. I tell him I always love him and want him to see, succeed and reach the potential we both know he possesses. There's an awkward silence. And he says, hey, mom, remember my fifth birthday party at grandma's house and you got me a jumper and the whole family came to celebrate? I miss happy memories like that. We stood up at the end of the visit and I held him so tight, wishing I could break him out, but I knew he had to do his time. Love you, son. Do good and follow the rules. I'll see you next weekend. I waited until I could no longer see on the, the reading on the back of his shirt that said Campo. I ran to my car with tears in my eyes and sobbed so hard I was grasping for air. I miss my son. I prayed once again for my journey home as I headed down the dirt terrain and loose gravel down that windy road. I've been through major battles as well as victories in my life, but I refuse to give up. I even got married and had another baby. My son graduated high school. I will continue to make better choices. And the most recent has been to further my education and let my kids know it's never too late to be a better you. I still have so much more mental, spiritual, and physical growth to reach to become a better mother, daughter, wife, and friend. And I will. Thank you.